Hello everyone, I'm Bill Sanders uh, from the University of Illinois and welcome to this uh, November issue of our TCIPG uh, seminar series. Um, uh, Tim Yardley will introduce our speaker in just a minute, but before he does that, uh, I wanted to send a, uh, a note of thanks out to all of you that participated in our uh, TCIPG Industry and Government Workshop on Tuesday and Wednesday of this week. I have to say that despite uh, a hurricane, which deterred just a few people, uh, we had the largest event ever, and, and I think by, by many measures the best event ever. So we thank those of you that uh, uh, worked hard to get here, and um, uh, worked hard to get here and, uh, and, and really actively participated. So we have uh, the most time we can for our speaker. I'll turn it over now to Tim Yardley, who will introduce Jason, and uh, I'm sure it will be a very interesting talk. Thank you, Bill. Um, so today we're, uh, we're lucky to have Jason Larson here. Jason's from Idaho National Labs, and he's a, a cybersecurity researcher at, uh, at Idaho National Labs. He's been there for about 10 years now. Um, and uh, has done a lot of interesting work there. Um, today he's going to be talking about cybersecurity of field uh, equipment in, in the SCADA realm, and uh, he's prepared a, a very interesting talk. Um, this is very different than, than a lot of the talks we normally have in these seminars, so um, make sure you pay attention. It, it'll be uh, a mix of, uh, of uh, deeply technical and uh, medium technical and even some high-level technical. So uh, um, hold on to your seats, and without further ado, Jason. Awesome. So, uh, do we have uh, do we have sound? Sound sound good. Excellent. Um, so yes. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, I'm a cybersecurity researcher at the Idaho National Lab, and uh, I specialize in the um, technical attacks on critical infrastructure. So my specialty is is uh, uh, which bits and bytes to go twiddle to get uh, uh, to get things to uh, uh, to go. So. Most of the time, uh, people uh, people uh, bring us uh, uh, bring us control systems, uh, um, field equipment, that type of stuff. We tear it apart. We uh, we find all the exploits. We we, uh, uh, we write a, write a bunch of exploits. We give them back to the vendor and say, please make all these exploits not work. Um, and that's what we do. Uh, so as a bits and bytes guy, uh, I tend to get uh, too far in the weeds. So at any time, if you have questions or I've skipped over something important, um, or you think I'm getting down too deep or I'm too high, give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down and uh, I'll adjust. So uh, if we're talking uh, field equipment, um, if we uh, look at uh, um, field equipment from the traditional SCADA attack pathways, this is the, the pathway that most people think about when they think about SCADA attacking is actually starting out on the internet and hacking on through the business land and hacking across the SCADA firewall onto the SCADA land and setting up and, uh, and, and, uh, and doing everything. Um, so the uh, the second uh, um, and uh, getting in and then the field equipment in the attack is generally almost uh, incidental. Um, you send commands to uh, to stuff up in the SCADA network and uh, all the stuff in the middle translates all the protocols and eventually some real world effect happens. Um, likewise, uh, if you go look at uh, um, uh, some of the uh, uh, more emerging effects where USB keys and we get into the supply chain and, and vendors and uh, um, we attack your antivirus and all the things the attackers are, are doing, they wake up on the SCADA LAN um, and once they wake up on the, uh, uh, the SCADA network, uh, generally most of the work in, involved in there is actually drilling back to the internet. So if you're going to wake up some, inside some random control center, um, then what you need to do is reestablish control. And uh, so most of the code there is going to be uh, drilling back into it. Um, so you also have the, uh, then when you get f closer to the field equipment, you have the, the field communications, um, where uh, the attacker starts at uh, microwave hop or uh, communication lines or whatever else, and then they can hack down deeply into the, to the field equipment. And so this is where uh, you start uh, getting into kind of the realities of, of, uh, of, of field equipment. So one of the things that you can say about field equipment is while you have control down there, the field equipment is directly controlling the process. Um, you actually don't have uh, knowledge of the process. Um, 
uh, down in the field equipment. So once you come over there and you get on, you, you get on to, uh, um, uh, to uh, um, uh, protect a relay or an RTU or something like that, and uh, you go look at it, um, the knowledge it has of the world is I have a bunch of rules and I have a bunch of things that I control. And nowhere down in the field equipment are these uh, things that I control mapped um, uh, mapped to the real world things I want. So there's not a label inside the field equipment that says um, says uh, breaker next to the bank that I want to rob right now. So if you go and hack into the uh, the field equipment from the field equipment from the the communications or directly into the field equipment, you don't have that knowledge. That knowledge is actually stored back up in the SCADA network um, and all of the configuration files and that type of stuff. So an attacker that uh, goes and hits the field equipment uh, directly or the field communications probably is going to have to hack both ways, down into the field equipment and then up into the SCADA system, because the SCADA system contains all of that domain knowledge that he needs to figure out um, which particular tags he needs to jiggle to go do his stuff. Um, so uh, um, uh, so what are the, the places that you usually want to go up in the SCADA system? Um, you need things like the operator screen files. You can tear them apart. It gives you a nice um, a, a nice view of the uh, meant to be consumed by a human of the process as it goes out. And underneath, if you tear into the files, you start getting all the constants and stuff that you need to uh, you need to have when you actually go and talk directly to the uh, um, to to the field equipment. You can get stuff out of the real time database and just reading things like change management logs, maintenance logs, the, things like that. Um, so why would you want to go attack the the, uh, the field equipment um, directly? So if you're up here in the SCADA system and you're like, haha, I'm a I'm a fat happy uh, uh, attacker and I can control everything from here, then why even bother to uh, descend down into the uh, field equipment? So the first uh, uh, reason you'd probably want to do that is to bypass sign ID checks. So uh, um, quite often you'll have um, uh, devices out near the things that you want to control that are sanity checking. So the classic case would be, a, say, like a, a boiler. Um, so you have the boiler, and you can say from the control system, hey, go ramp up the boiler to, uh, to 1,000 degrees. Um, but uh, down in the actual controller, you're going to have some uh, you're going to have some logic that says if the uh, uh, boiler gets above 300 degrees, then just cut off the uh, cut off the heating supply. Um, there's sanity checks down in the the field equipment. So up in the SCADA system, you may not have the control to bypass those. Um, so the second uh, reason uh, you might want to do that is that's where the field equipment is where you get to start. Um, so this is especially true in smart grid. So if you're down in the um, in the uh, meter on the side of your house, you can just walk up to the meter on the side of your house, rip it off the side of the house, tear it apart, and it's like, aha, this is a meter. And this gives you your first uh, first uh, step into the system. Um, this is also true with uh, um, uh, facility uh, devices outside the facility, um, like uh, uh, cameras, uh, tank farms, stuff like that. It's not uncommon to have um, devices that are hooked up uh, in the field equipment outside of it, and then uh, um, uh, the uh, the th the uh, um, the third uh, class is is all the stuff that's not um, that's not related. So it's pretty common to uh, tunnel other protocols over the top of your field equipment protocols, uh, weather sensors, badge readers, cameras. Running ca uh, fiber across everything is really expensive, and so the attacker may start at a camera or or a um, or uh, a camera or a, uh, a badge reader or that type of stuff. So uh, um, when we start to looking at these individual devices, if somebody comes over here and uh, picks up a uh, uh, picks up a piece of uh, um, a piece of uh, field equipment, drops it on your desk, then uh, um, this is really hacking like it's 1999, probably actually less than 1999. So the the processors that are running most of this um, lack a kernel. So as computer scientists, we'd uh, we like to think of operating systems having virtual address spaces and um, and memory protection and all that fun stuff. Um, but uh, really, in most field equipment, this isn't the case. Um, you have a central processor that's running one main task, usually has some sort of thread library, that type of stuff. Um, so uh, a lot of times, even if the chip actually supports uh, virtual memory protections, then um, the field equipment uh, um, or the operating system won't use that. Um, so we see that when we break into a, a number of the devices that uh, um, that the processor supports the NX bit, but uh, we don't actually. Uh, um, it's actually not set. It's not used. You have to do that. So these really aren't operating systems in the kind of computer science-y um, thing. So um, when the attacker comes in and, and approaches one of these things, then uh, the first thing he's got to deal with is uh, what uh, what I call the rebootiness. 
So uh, um, if you come over there and you're, uh, you're attacking a, uh, um, a Windows box and you go and you get a buffer overflow on one of the, uh, uh, on one of the services, it's like, aha, I have the service and all I have to do is, uh, is uh, take control of the instruction pointer and start running my shell code. All things are good. Um, but uh, uh, embedded systems have uh, um, this fail safe that if all else fails, then just go reboot yourself because um, you'll just come back up on your normal restart mode. You'll come back up, you can run a bunch of stuff. Um, so they've got watchdog timers, and a lot of these things actually have like per per thread watchdog timers, et cetera, that make things really hard. And common reset lines. So um, it's quite often that uh, the, the chips watch each other. So if the uh, if chip A uh, senses that chip B has gone away, they're going to reboot the whole device. So when the attacker is actually compromising onto the system, then the first thing he's got to do is his shell code just can't take over the CPU and start running his instructions. He's got to immediately patch himself back into the uh, uh, into the processor and keep pro the processor up alive and responding immediately. Um, otherwise, the uh, the device is going to uh, um, going to reboot. So this is actually a pretty common configuration when you're hitting uh, um, when you're hitting uh, build equipment. Is yes, you'll have two chips that are sitting there processing stuff and some sort of like serial bus or something between them. And uh, if you come over there and you just write some shell code and take over one of the devices, then the other device comes over there and says, "Are you there? Are you there? Are you there?" And then invokes the suicide pack. The whole thing reboots and uh, and um, the attacker is is popped off of uh, the system. So, uh, um, so if you're looking at uh, um, what you stick into the uh, um, uh, into it, then uh, um, I've actually tried where I've uh, come over there and uh, got my way onto a uh, um, onto a piece of field equipment, and then uh, it's like I'll just take over all the functions of this field equipment. I'm a smart guy. I can I can I can code. I can reverse engineer a bunch of stuff. What I'm just going to do is I'm going to do all the things that are normally um, normally involved in keeping this processor alive and happy and functioning. So uh, and and re rewrite it all from scratch. And uh, um, even though I've tried really really hard, I've never actually been able to do that successfully. Um, that's because. Um, uh, uh, when uh, you're sticking together a lot of these embedded systems, the engineers don't uh, don't as much debug the systems as work around the bugs. So if there's some sort of race condition over here, um, uh, then uh, um, a lot of times they'll code around that bug rather than uh, rather than actually fixing the race condition or uh, um, or memory management problem or that case. And so uh, um, in most case, uh, cases, the attackers are going to have to uh, um, uh, modify what's there and not rewrite it and try and take over all the functions of the uh, uh, all the functions of the processor as they found it. And so they have to do that all in the first stage um, when it's hitting the processor. Um, so uh, the common ways, uh, the two most common ways of doing that is hooking the vector table and uh, and also hooking the main roof. The vector table is really easy and it's by far the most common way. So uh, um, in most microcontrollers, you have a vector table at the top or bottom of, of memory, and the the very easiest way to get in and hook your code um, is uh, is just to go up to the vector table, um, overwrite the vector table entry with uh, with your rootkit code. And then, uh, um, then call the original uh, handler that was hooked to that vector table entry. Um, this is also for on the defensive side the easiest thing to find. So you just run over there, look to see what the vector table used to be, and uh, and the root kit is revealed. Um, so the second most common uh, 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 second most common uh, uh, approach is just to go hook the main loop in some way. Um, so if you go look at the logic of most microcontrollers, it runs some uh, startup and initialization code. It goes and uh, reads a uh, reads a message or response to event, processes it, and does it over and over again. Um, in that case, um, the the attacker has a couple of things that uh, that he has as an advantage. One is he can overwrite all the initialization code. Initialization code is sitting there in memory, taking up space. And uh, um, he could just overwrite it and do whatever else he wants, and then uh, find some place to hook the main loop and just stick in the process. This is going to give the attacker um, a lot more uh, um, uniform access to the instruction pointer. Whereas if you're hooked off of one of the vector tables, um, you may only get CPU cycles whenever there's a uh, an interrupt or event on that particular uh, particular thing. So he's going to have to write all of his logic to deal with this kind of bumpy up and down event type stuff. Whereas if you go in and hook the main loop, um, then you get these these nice reliable repeat repeatable um, CPU cycles so that you can come and sense your environment and that type of stuff. Um, so, uh, um, so the second thing he's got to uh, um, uh, 
got to do is uh, uh, grab hold of the inter uh, um, the inter microcontroller communications. So uh, um, a lot of times when you actually are looking at a system, there'll be one microcontroller that handles all the communication that speaks all of your high-level protocols, and another microcontroller that's actually handling the logic of the device. It's handling um, uh, the uh, uh, the trips and the, the fault protection and all of the stuff that has to go. And so they're usually hooked together, those CPUs are hooked together through some sort of serial bus. Um, so writing shellcode for this is actually just write, like writing a fine shock shellcode um, in traditional IT hacking. Um, so you can go find an open call um, and open serial ports. Um, you can go walk file descriptors. Or in a lot of cases, then uh, um, the actual serial communications will be memory mapped into a UART. And you can just go read and write from, um, from constant memory locations in memory and read and write off of, uh, on and off of the serial buses. So uh, um, this is a pretty common thing to, uh, to look at, um, is you'll have multiple CPUs um, inside, of the, uh, inside of the embedded device and uh, um, only one of them controls the stuff that you want to control. So in this case, uh, um, somebody drops a, uh, uh, drops a box on my desk and it's got, say, an Ethernet port uh, with a network card. Um, if I actually go and, say, like, get a buffer overflow in the TCP IP stack, I'm going to get code execution on the actual network card. Um, but uh, then the, uh, the network card is modular. It's, uh, you can replace the network module with a, with a serial module or whatever else. And it speaks an entirely, uh, entirely different protocol up to the main CPU. Um, so uh, uh, just inside the box itself, this isn't a single hop thing. Once you get code execution on the box, you don't have code execution on the whole box. So in this case, I'm going to have to uh, um, hop from the, the network card into the main CPU, maybe across the backplane onto a backplane CPU, finally until I, out to an IO CPU until I have moment, momentary control with the pins that actually control the process. Um, so within this, this is a, a multi-hop uh, um, multi chain. Um, so uh, this is actually uh, really common when uh, we're doing things like smart meters, um, where you'll have the long haul communication that runs the uh, the back haul uh, wireless out to the uh, utility, um, and then you'll have a main uh, a main CPU that's actually running the smart meter. When you get code execution, um, you can get code execution on that uh, um, on that wireless antenna, and that still doesn't give you uh, access to the core guts of the uh, of the uh, smart meter. So. Uh, um, there's a uh, there's a problem though um, is uh, so I'm I'm going to move through these CPUs on the uh, on the field equipment and uh, and get to get all this stuff but uh, um, if I take over the uh, serial connection and use it as my control uh, between the CPUs and use it as my control channel then uh, um, all of a sudden it's not it's not uh, actually talking the way it's supposed to be, which leads us back to the rebooting us. So if I'm on one CPU, and I hit the other CPU, and I just take over the serial and say, like, hey, here you're my root kit channel. Here, take my commands. Then the other CPU is going to say, like, ah, I haven't heard from the other CPU for a while. Let's just go ahead and reboot. In that case, I'm kicked off the box again. Um, so uh, you must. Uh, so the attacker must uh, preserve the serial connection protocol um, on both sides at all the time in order to keep the device up, and so he can hack further into the uh, into the to the CPU. So the uh, um, so in some way he must uh, actually tunnel the original message um, over the top of his rootkit messages. So uh, so one approach that he can do is just to take a, and establish a new protocol on both ends, which he has to do in the um, the the initial exploitation of the second CPU, and just start tunneling the the original messages um, over the top of it. Um, uh, a, a better approach is uh, something we refer to as, as uh, um, protocol interleaving. In this case, then, um, you just have to put little hooks uh, into, uh, into both sides that differentiates between a normal message and a rootkit message. Um, in that case, you can send the normal messages um, across and then uh, um, just interleave a rootkit message uh, every, uh, every so often. And the, the, the stub on the other side figures out that there's a rootkit message, sends it off to the rootkit, normal messages go to the more normal, and you get a nice switching um, a uh, nice switching paradigm, and it's actually a lot more stable because if the one of the the uh, uh, if one of the chips uh, reboots, then the rootkit messages will, most of the time will just be ignored. Um, so a powerful attacker can actually do better um, uh, than uh, um, than just protocol interleaving. 
And so uh, one of the techniques that uh, um, uh, that we use is uh, just using uh, coding techniques um, to preserve the various artifacts of the original control channel. So if you go look at a protocol, there's going to be some magic numbers and some links, and you can't really mess with those, because if you mess with the magic number, it's not a valid packet. If you mess with a link that reads too big, big there's lots of other fields that can actually um, be used to, uh, uh, to tunnel data. Um, so, uh, um, so, uh, um, uh, so what the attacker can do is uh, come over there and analyze which of the fields are actually important to the overall health of the protocol, and then use a coding system to uh, um, to replace those. Um, so, uh, um, so uh, if you, uh, um, it's pretty easy to um, write an algorithm then uh, that will take uh, take uh, your actual message, um, turn it through basically a blender loop. And then uh, um, out of the blender loop comes all the preserved artifacts and then the, uh, the, the scramble one. One of the upsides of this is um, inside each one of these little uh, these CPUs, you may only have uh, tens of K worth of memory. And so um, space is at a premium. So while um, uh, this, may, uh, this adds the complexity in nice computer science algorithms, um, the complex algorithms a lot of times don't take a lot of space in, uh, space in memory. So you can use a complex coding algorithm to decode the message, pull out the stuff for the rootkit channel, and then shove it off to the rootkit, com rootkit uh, um, things. And then these, uh, these particular messages now are unlikely to be detected by casual analysis, by, uh, by analyzers, etc. So when the, uh, um, when the defender comes over there and clips onto all the lines and sees all the rootkit messages going back and forth, um, they have all the headers and magic numbers that his eye is going to use to detect if something is wrong. Um, <clears throat> so the second problem that uh, the attacker has is where, do he, where does he put the, uh, the rootkit? So a lot of vendors see extra space in the flash as um, as actually a waste of revenue. If there's extra space in the flash, I could have added some some feature, and that would have sold me more units. Um, so a lot of times when uh, uh, when the attacker gets there, all the flash is all full, and so it's like, ha! Oh, I want to stick my rootkit in there to uh, to detect something and and do something bad to this uh, this process in the future. Um, so. Uh, um, so it's it's all full, and this is feature creep. Like a lot of your uh, um, like your network cards now actually have web servers on them. Why do I need a web server on my on my network card? I probably don't, but somebody thought it would sell a web uh, sell an extra net network card somewhere in the future, so they stuck a web server on there because they could to fill up some face uh, space. Um, so uh, um, there's a few approaches you can take with uh, with actually sticking in the uh, the root kit. Um, so the first one, um, which is kind of the First uh, attempt to lazy unskilled um, is to, to for a larger uh, a larger microcontroller to uh, to slave a smaller microcontroller. So if the smaller microcontroller has immediate access over the pins that you want to sit there and jiggle, um, then uh, um, the larger microcontroller shoves a payload down into it and then immediately um, comes over there and says, "Turn pin seven on, turn, turn pin seven off." Um, this approach works really good for uh, uh, for motherboard root, uh, root kits. So if you're if you're wanting to uh, um, take over the USB controller uh, to take over your iPad for uh, 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 your iPod for whatever that you can just shove the code down into uh, into the USB controller and the main processor can sit there and use it as a slave um, so this is a, a Arduino uno um, which is a uh, um, which is a good example of this. Here we have the, the main Atmel AVR processor where we can run a much bigger payload. And then we have the little USB processor down here that's, uh, that's in charge of the USB stack. Um, I may not have enough room in the 4K of flash to keep this working as a USB processor and go take over, um, take over my, um, my main machine um, by emulating a mouse or loading some sort of USB driver or whatever else. So I can use the main processor to just uh, slave, the, uh, slave the smaller processors and push me messages in and out. Um, uh, so uh, um, the uh, uh, so a, a basic approach that you can use to clear space is just to replace the little used functions of the rootkit. So uh, um, you can analyze the function and say nobody's ever going to use the web server. Let's just throw away the web server and reuse all that space for uh, for the rootkit. Um, so flash is flash. Um, so it generally doesn't care where in flash you stick it. Um, most uh, uh, most uh, microcontrollers use fundamental architectures these days. And so you can dump everything. So some of the obvious things to dump are like string tables. Uh, we don't need to interact with human anyway. Throw the string tables away. Um, we don't need the humans to see the images. Let's throw the images away and just shove our rootkit into it. Um, so a, uh, an intermediate approach um, uh, that uh, that works is uh, local compression. Um, 
so if you get uh, so most compilers actually do a really poor job of uh, interfunction optimization. So if you look at the standard compiler tool chain, um, you'll start off with a, a bunch of C code, compiles down to a function, and then the linker grabs all those functions and stick it together. And nowhere in the middle of this chain do most compilers actually come over there and say, I have two functions of memory that are mostly the same, or at least partially the same, and they don't do the cross-function op optimization. So since the assembly is poorly optimized, you can actually clear space in the uh, in the image and preserve all its functionality um, by um, uh, by uh, reoptimizing the uh, reoptimizing. This would be a simple example of of clearing some space using tail calling, um, where uh, um, there's a uh, there's a bunch of pop pop rets uh, in the microcontroller. You probably wouldn't be uh, x86, but you have a you have a, uh, a post amble and they're uh, um, basically uh, repeated across all the functions. You can come over there, stick all the post ambles together, jump into the post amble stream, and that uh, clears a small piece of memory uh, at the top of each of the uh, uh, or at the bottom of each of the functions. Um, so uh, um, so if you go and look for this. Uh, um, I'll look for this in the in the entire um, uh, in the entire uh, uh, binary. Then um, uh, this actually becomes a uh, um, a greatest common subtype uh, sub, uh, a greatest common uh, size match with repeats. Um, so you can just go and find uh, blocks of assembly codes that are repeated, and then turn them into a, a call code and uh, and compress them down and leave little spaces uh, uh, little spaces left. And so, uh, um, what's left is an image that actually looks like Swiss cheese. You've made little little spaces in memory all over the place where you can sprinkle code. Um, that's actually um, you actually can stick a whole rootkit into the little spaces. But it's really expensive because at the end of uh, at the end of every space, you're going to have to jump to the next space and at the end of the space, and all each one of those jumps takes up space. And so, um, if you can't uh, if you can't recover uh, enough space for a number of instructions in each of the little pieces of of Swiss cheese, um, then uh, um, then you might as well not recover that space because uh, it won't clear enough space. So uh, um, an advanced, uh, a more advanced approach is um, uh, what uh, I refer to as a refactoring firmware. So instead of just clearing little spaces of Swiss cheese, what we want to do is is clear an entire big chunk of stuff um, into the uh, into the firmware space. So uh, in order to do that, what I do is I start off and uh, um, I break the firmware back out into all of his instructions, and uh, and then uh, um, and break each one of those instructions down into its micro operations. Um, so for example, if we in one instruction streams we had a move the ECS, ECX register or put six into the ECX register in one function, uh, the, then they may use ECX for that register, and another function they may use EDX for that register. Um, those are basically the same equivalent opcode streams, um, but uh, they're not going to turn it into the same equivalent bytecode. Um, uh, uh, likewise, uh, different optimizers and different uh, uh, dec uh, decisions the compiler made is going to mutate those streams that are doing basically the same thing. So what I do is I take each in each instruction and break it down into its uh, its micro operation. Um, and so if you do this right, you can take a binary, break it down into a set of micro operations, and then reassemble it back into the binary, and you're guaranteed that it's going to preserve all of the functionality in the binary that's going to execute the way it's supposed to execute. Um, so if we look at like a push EAX, push EAX is actually a, a complex operation composed of two micro operations. It's going to subtract four from the stack pointer, and it's going to move the value of the EAX, EAX register into the memory where the stack pointer is uh, Going and so uh, um, uh, for each instruction, you can break it down to a set of micro ops that can be assembled into a, into an abstract syntax tree. Um, so this is actually an ARM assembly, and this is actually the uh, uh, syntax tree that describes that uh, that uh, um, that assembly operation and all of its side effects. Um, so if uh, if you go look and as you start reading through all of the details of each of the uh, the assembly instructions, they actually can get the uh, the number of micro operations it takes to actually describe an assembly instruction can actually be um, fairly complex. And here, here it's taking uh, six, eight, um, nine, uh, nine micro operations to just describe this one assembly instruction. Um, but once you break it down into a common, uh, a common language for, uh, uh, for the micro operations, then you can take any target CPU. So you can start with an ARM, an x86, an Atmel AVR, or whatever else, and then break it down and describe it in a common language um, across all of the different, uh, um, all of the different uh, ones. 
So uh, if we take all these micro operations and then turn them into uh, um, a graph of graphs of micro operations, we get this really, really huge uh, monstrous graph of all these micro operations that, that describes the functioning of the firmware. Um, in that case, then we can start taking the, the, the large graph and, uh, um, and looking for uh, repeated patterns in the graph and then turning that and reducing the graph. Um, this actually turns into the, um, uh, the greatest, common, uh, greatest repeated common subtree problem, which is an NP hard problem. And so um, since we don't like to solve NP hard problems in, uh, um, in computer science, then, uh, um, then uh, uh, we want a better way to go about it. So uh, the approach that I take is actually the Smith, uh, the Smith Waterman approach. So there's several sets of uh, um, of uh, algorithms that were that were uh, created to uh, um, to deal with uh, uh, genetic sequences. So in genetic sequences, you have a bunch of uh, proteins that repeat, and then you might have two proteins that act or two uh, um, two protein or uh, um, amino acids that do exactly the same thing. They're substitutes for each other. And also, then there can be uh, there can be gaps, and then those uh, those again. Um, and so when you're searching for mutations and matches and stuff like that, they uh, came up with a bunch of algorithms to to uh, um, go and look for uh, the greatest uh, um, the, the the best match with replacements and gaps. And uh, so there were two algorithms that uh, came out of that research. Uh, there was the Needleman-Wish algorithm and the, Swiss, the, the Smith-Waterman alg uh, algorithm. Um, so, uh, and then you can give uh, various weights on how expensive gaps are and various weights on how expensive a, uh, a replacement character is. And so this is, a, this is exactly what we need to start matching our subtree graph. Um, so uh, uh, basically, what you do is uh, you assign um, each of the micro ops um, uh, in your in your normalized form of the tree um, a value, um, and then uh, um, uh, look at that as a stream of instructions. And then you can uh, um, come over there and, and uh, find uh, um, find the in length best matches between the series of uh, um, instructions and the shotgun approach. So when we're matching DNA now, we don't uh, we don't match uh, we don't uh, sequence DNA as a whole long string. We break it up into little strings and then overlapping little strings, and we stick them all together statistically. Um, you can use the same approach for reoptimizing the uh, the firmware binary at the same time. So basically, you can chop all your normalized tree up into to chains hook the chains up, have overlapping chains, and start looking for the greatest common match between all of those chains in post-processing and finding a good, uh, a good solution for the NP-hard problem. Um, so that basically then turns into a table um, where you have um, each of your candidate change, chains in the, the top and bottom. Um, you, uh, you run through and apply all the, the, the weights and the penalties for the, the gap measurements, as, and you walk through, uh, walk through the table, and it'll give you the best, uh, best possible localized match between the two chains. Um, so uh, in, uh, in genetics, it's going to look something like this, where you can have, depending on the weights that you apply, then uh, um, you're going to have the, uh, um, the various letters. And it's either going to match in, in little clumps, or if the, uh, the, the penalty for having a gap is less, then it will match, it'll match a, a two equivalent streams with those, uh, uh, the two equivalent streams with, uh, with those gaps. And so you can sit there and play with the, weight, uh, the weights. Um, so this pro uh, approach actually, oh, I should probably um, mention here. So um, at this point, then you have all the nodes in the graph, and you have a bunch of equivalencies with the with the repeats, the gaps, and the replacements. Um, and then you can actually do um, fairly good optimization between the two, because each one of these uh, sequences will turn into parts of your binary. You can do the replacements of the of the binary, um, and uh, and with the weights, then turn uh, several routines that are related and just uh, um, uh, simply off a little bit down into one routine with a couple of if statements and stuff in the middle, which you can describe in the graph. Um, so, uh, um, so if, uh, after we do that and we get all of our work down, um, you can actually get uh, um, compression ratios of about 20 to 30 percent across multiple architectures. Um, uh, so uh, then, uh, um, when you want to stick your rootkit in, um, you can actually just then take your rootkit, compile your rootkit, and it's like, okay, um, so when uh, when the, uh, the the moon is full and the power is high and all that fun stuff, um, we'll search for all these conditions and then go to evil stuff to, to it. Um, you can actually then compile your rootkit. Um, merge the graph um, of your rootkit with the graph of the original firmware, break it all down, re-optimize the whole thing, um, and re-optimize it back into the space that the original firmware is without dumping any, uh, without dumping any uh, um, functionality in the target firmware. Um, 
so uh, um, we can actually use these techniques on the other side um, for forensics. So this is actually a pretty common occurrence. Somebody walks up to us and says, um, here's a meter that came off of the side of somebody's house. We think evil people are in the meter doing evil things. Um, uh, uh, please tell us if evil people are in the evil meter doing evil things. And uh, um, so uh, this is kind of a matter of uh, a, a bunch of uh, um, test of patience. So then you go up to the manufacturer and it's like, oh, okay, I need to know what this firmware originally looked like. Um, so uh, um, you say, I need uh, uh, um, all the versions of, uh, of your firmware from whenever this meter was installed. And the, the guy says, well, um, the current version of the, uh, uh, the firmware is 5.1.3.2. Um, install the firmware. It's like, no, no, I'm doing forensics. I can't overwrite the firmware. I need, I need, I need the old version of the firmware. They're like, oh, I, I got to go ask somebody about that. You wait about a couple of days, and, uh, um, and you call them up again. They're like, yeah, you need to upgrade to 5.1 point. And so change control is a real problem and uh, actually comes up more often than you think. And so you basically run around this circle until um, you either run out of time or run out of patience. Um, so uh, at that point, you pretty much have to go do it yourself and look at it. So getting the firmware can be a problem, um, but luckily on most uh, field equipment, um, most field equipment still have JTAG ports uh, enabled. So you can pull onto the plug on the JTAG ports, pull it out that way. Um, if not, then uh, it's pretty easy just to lift a uh, lift a uh, um, a piece of flash off the board, stick it into a flash reader, and read it. Except now I'm just left with uh, the stuff that was on there, but I don't have a uh, a known good to compare it to. So I'm so I've got the flash, and I don't have a known good. So how do I go about finding the rootkit that somebody's stuck in this? Um, so the uh, um, so the concept that I came up with this I call a binary normal form. So when I'm breaking uh, down all of this firmware down into its micro op trees, um, then uh, um, then basically one of the things that you're undoing is you're undoing all the compiler optimizations. So if the compiler optimization came in there and wanted to put a, a zero into a, a register on x86, everybody XORs the register with itself because it's a two byte instruction, and moving zero into a register is a is a uh, um, is a five byte instruction. And so uh, everybody turns an XOR, uh, 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 a move zero into an XOR, XOR. Um, so uh, um, each compiler and each revision and each optimization setting actually changes the way it goes. And, and so when you're breaking it down, you have to reverse all of these optimizations. Um, so if you're just looking at how, um, how the optimizers go, um, so an XOR, ECX, ECX is the same as moving zero into ECX. Um, so uh, if you see like an add zero to a register, that's a no-op. Shifting a register by zero is a no-op. Um, so uh, um, if you look at some compilers, then um, even though you have defined ABI, they'll move into the top of the stack frame to save, uh, to save some extra operations instead of doing a push. Um, uh, a lot of uh, compilers will optimize a, uh, a multiply by a power of two into a shift operation, et cetera. Um, so if we just look at two versions of output from, from, uh, from GCC, then uh, both of these are just moving three into a the word three into a buffer. And, and so you can see, in one of them, you actually have the string three, and you're and you're shoving it in a buffer. And uh, in the other version of it, it, the compiler optimization said, well, you know, three is just this kind of short uh, short integer. Um, what we'll do is we're going to turn the actual word three into two integers, and we'll just move the two integers into the buffer. And this is the exact same code, which should turn into the exact same abstract syntax tree um, if you do your job right. Um, but uh, they are very different in the assembly. Um, uh, so uh, um, generally, when you uh, look at a compiler, the compiler makes the same optimizations in all the code all the way throughout it. So if you did some other small string move in the top one, it would still do it via mem copy. And if you did it in the bottom one, it's still going to do it with the move. So the compiler is generally consistent throughout their entire compiling process. Um, so when we're converting things back into its uh, fr into its uh, in a binary normal form, if we note um, where the uh, where the compiler differences came from, um, we can uh, uh, make some sort of a, some sort of inference about which chunks of code were compiled with which compiler with which settings. 
Um, so, uh, uh, so in this case, um, and we can sign the, we can sign each of those compilers, um, colors or tags or whatever else we want. And so in this case, this is the, the, uh, um, the startup for a glibc, um, compiled on two different architectures, um, with different optimization settings and stuff after we've turned it into it. And so this is very fun to look at because it's just a linear set of, of operations. But on one side, um, uh, so the side with the, the green uh, uh, the green on it I think is arm assembly and the uh, the other side is x86 assembly uh, but if you go look at it then uh, um, it's the same code it turns into the same graph but the uh, um, they made different uh, decisions on how to perform each of the operations and we can color those um, and so uh, if something comes from the same source code even on different architectures they should uh, should turn into the same Graph. And so what we do is uh, uh, pull out the firmware. We convert all the the firmware into its uh, in, into its uh, syntax tree. We convert uh, convert the syntax tree into a binary neural form, and uh, then we start uh, um, we assign colors to every optimization that we know about. And so in this case, we pulled out this uh, simple piece of thing, and the uh, the attacker has uh, patched the binary. Um, uh, patch the binary on it. So uh, we have the graph of uh, of one, which is a set of optimizations, which is in white, and another set of optimizations in red, which really quickly reveals the rootkit because the compiler, when he wrote his code, either by hand-coded assembly or through a compiler, has made different optimization choices, and those optimization choices reveal the rootkit. Um, so how much time do I have left? About 20 minutes. About 20 minutes? Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I I was just hitting my 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 last topic. So I was gonna um, go. So uh, um, so uh, with the with more and more attackers, um, uh, hacking embedded systems now is is has gone main for mainstream. It used to be like oh you can get onto mice and keyboards and. Uh, um, uh, and uh, um, encrypting USB keys and stuff it used to be like really uber elite cool stuff, and it's like, oh yes, we are we are so elite. But this is actually uh, really turning into uh, uh, mainstream hacking uh, um, uh, hacking now. And so there's more of a uh, um, a push from the uh, uh, from the defender community uh, to go in and look and verify all of these uh, these firmware. Um, so uh, one of the buzzwords is that to making. Uh, um, uh, to making uh, evidence and uh, firmware evidence and attestation that you're running a particular chunk of firmware. Um, so, um, so one of the questions is, where is the attackers going to go next? If we if we get good checksumming on on the uh, the firmware of, of some of these various chips, uh, where are they going to go? Um, where are they going to go? How are they going to adapt? And so the uh, um, uh, as we start getting change control on the firmware of all of these devices. So the first answer that they're probably going to do is just to make the chip lie. So if uh, there's a chunk of the protocol that says, please give me your checksum, and I control the chip communications, the easiest thing to, to, to do is just say, um, yeah, my checksum is the right checksum. Just, just, just believe me in that case. Um, but that's probably not going to last too terribly long as we move checksum into hardware or or that type of stuff. Um, so one of the uh, one of the things that uh, uh, at least I've been uh, um, working with in the the theoretical case um, and uh, having some success is uh, using uh, um, using a, a smaller chip to crawl back up to the main chip. So uh, um, there, every uh, every little sub chip now um, tends to have firmware on your uh, on your thing. So even little serial controllers or uh, um, temperature sensors or everything, everything has got a little chunk of firmware in it now, um, with little serial buses and everything going there. So it's probably going to be impossible to check some all of the firmwares on all of the chips on all of the boards. Um, so probably they're just going to check the large firmwares on the main chips. Um, so, uh, um, so it is possible to use a very small chip, not capable of, uh, uh, not not capable of actually holding all the rootkit um, and a block store on a shared bus um, to actually bootstrap yourself back at back up during boot time into uh, into memory on the main chip. So if they check some the uh, main chip or pull the flash uh, pull the flash off, um, that uh, it will actually be the correct flash and your rootkit won't detect it. Um, so, uh, um, so uh, I, I tend to call this wrap up. Um, 
So Rob from return oriented programming. So uh, young hackers like to rename all old uh, hacking techniques. So we did ROP for years and years, and then somebody called it ROP and lots of, wrote lots of paper. But uh, um, the basic concept is the same when you're doing this. Um, ROP gadgets don't have to be small. Um, so most people use the ROP gadgets as these little small things to adjust the stack and stuff to get your uh, um, to get your shell code up up and running. Um, but uh, gadgets can be really big. Um, gadgets can be uh, can be uh, whole chunks of your uh, uh, bootloader. They can be whole chunks of your crypto routines. They can be large parts of your program. Um, so uh, um, pieces of your uh, um, of the compression and uh, and crypto routines uh, can provide heavyweight building blocks for uh, for reshuffling uh, for reshuffling firmware. And so uh, uh, a microcontroller can actually be bootstrapped from one state to another using a small chunk of uh, small chunk of uh, um, or using off chip storage and a small chunk of uh, of, uh, of code on a very small microcontroller. Um, so and preferably for the attacker, this will be encrypted serial memory. Um, uh, but you can use Slack, Slack space and uh, uh, Slack space and. Uh, uh, and flash and uh, um, backup bootloaders and a bunch of stuff like that. So the the basic uh, the basic configuration you have for uh, for this is you look at your your uh, your slow data store or the serial memory or whatever else and your small microcontroller that may only have one or two k worth of uh, flash and your main memory. And so when the main microcontroller uh, pulls from the uh, pulls from the data store, so your SPI flash or whatever else, and you have the small microcontroller. Um, the shared data buses, um, the small microcontrollers don't have to respect the rules of the shared data buses. Um, so mo uh, most of the time, we have a chip select line or something like that says, "Hey, you on the bus, um, it's your time to uh, yeah, it's your time to uh, to talk, and it's your time to talk, and it's your time to talk." And if, uh, if you put a very small chunk of uh, shell code in the middle of the small microcontroller. Um, uh, then you can just uh, override those settings and talk when you're not supposed to talk. <clears throat> um, and then uh, um, during the load process, when you're loading a chunk of flash or a chunk of data off of the data store, um, then you can unshuffle the data into, uh, into memory. Um, so, uh, so as it's loading, and you can uh, have the the constants as they hit the bootloaders and the crypto routines and the uncompressors and that type of stuff, you can use these uh, um, uh, use these blobs as very large uh, um, as as very large blocks to start shuffling the uh, the programs in memory. And then you can just stick the, your your extra code onto the uh, middle, add a few computer science type programs, and with uh, with enough shuffles um, going through uh, like Taylor reductions and uh, and and that type of stuff, you can actually take all of your firmware, um, unshuffle it during the load process, and shuffle it into a new firmware image um, using only code execution on a very small chip and uh, um, the Slack space in in an external uh, an external store. And uh, I was going to write a bunch about the actual routines that. I use for that, but I only have an hour, or so um, so uh, maybe maybe in the future I will I will uh, do a presentation just on that. Um, uh, so uh, um, a clever attacker can uh, make it so that uh, the complete in-memory image um, uh, also is uh, is uh, um, is only valid when specific conditions are met. Um, so, uh, uh, so about uh, four or five years ago, attackers started playing with a, uh, a, me uh, a method called temporal return reporters. And in that case, they were writing shell code that was only valid for a very small piece of uh, a very short uh, uh, chunk of time. So, uh, um, so when you come in and you throw the exploit, um, it would actually use a counter or a timer or something the attacker could predict as part of the actual shell code payload. And so, if somebody recorded the, sh the recorded the exploit, tried to throw the exploit again a few minutes later, the exploit's not going to work anymore because it used uh, uh, used some of these counters and conditions um, uh, counters and conditions to uh, to actually execute. Um, during the unshuffling, um, a clever attacker can use artifacts within the uh, uh, the main firmware itself, um, so that the uh, um, the the complete uh, um, the complete unshuffled um, and malicious image is actually only available at particular times of code execution. Um, so, since the attacker can predict um, where in the memory map regions various pins are, um, what the values of the pins are, analogs and digitals um, over there, these are a lot of times stored in very very predictable regions. Regions, it's easy to make a uh, 
it's easy to make a shuffler that makes use of those uh, those regions so that when uh, um, the data is coming off of the, uh, the the store, the SBI memory or the flash or whatever else, and you're corrupting as it comes through, it actually uses the values from those. And then during the unshuffling process, the unshuffling process only unwinds um, when the payload is uh, is set to execute. So the payload then can um, doesn't have to be running in memory all the time. It can only unshuffle. It can unshuffle at a, a particular um, particular points in time. Um, this has the added benefit that uh, uh, the main flash of, so the main flash of the chip um, uh, remains unaltered. So during forensics, it should look uh, good. Um, the, uh, the the small chip um, uh, uh, can, the stuff can be found there, um, but also doesn't get doesn't give away the attacker's intent. And then the off ch chip store is now hopelessly mangled. Um, uh, well, not hopelessly mangled. It's not cryptographically hard, but is it's mangled to the point that easy analysis uh, won't recover the conditions and what it does when it uh, when it unwinds. Um, so and nowhere in the whole system are bytes stored that look like executable code. Um, uh, that uh, can go. So, um, for looking there, kind of on the the meta things, um, uh, one of the things that uh, uh, looking at all these t techniques and uh, what's going on out in the world is that uh, the attackers in in the space inside field equipment are really winning. Um, they're being uh, Okay, um, they're being uh, um, very creative, uh, drilling down into stuff, um, solving all the problems um, at that. And the defenders really are still back on the uh, the, the SCADA network and the IT networks um, because as soon as you leave the IT network and start hitting the field equipment, we kind of are hitting the end of tools. There's not a good tool set and knowledge base, et cetera, for us to go in there and pull the rootkits out and find out what the bad people are doing for us. This is, makes it really, really attractive um, for the uh, for the attacker community. And so, uh, um, and we have no real good way uh, in any sane way um, uh, to uh, to actually do that. So like even if we put firmware checksumming uh, uh, mechanisms in our current versions of smart meters, um, the attacker will just lie about the firmware. So if you know what the checksum is supposed to be, here, here's your checksum. We don't have any, uh, we don't have the cryptographic routines, um, uh, the hardware assurances or anything like that to actually um, go figure out if they're there. And so uh, um, right now the attackers are definitely winning. Um, the defenders really aren't playing yet. Um, and so, uh, um, so as one of the uh, as one of the uh, defender side guys, I would like to see us uh, uh, put a lot more effort into uh, um, uh, into being able to extract these types of things and hit the uh, um, hit the attackers where it hurts, um, so that they can't uh, um, uh, just like uh, uh, when we start doing address space randomization in, inside memory and Windows and doing all of these things uh, that uh, that really looked at how the attackers were getting code execution and uh, and and hurting them there. Um, I think we need to do the same thing in embedded systems. Go looking at all the problems of where they store their firmware, um, how they how they get it, how it gets unpacked into memory, um, how they keep the chip from rebooting, and start really attacking them at the the core core pieces of, of how they do their job um, so that uh, um, the, the defenders can start winning again, because uh, um, right now the attackers are definitely winning. Um, so, uh, um, so with that, I think I'll open it to questions. Uh, thank you, Jason. That's a great presentation. So, um, at the end there, you you made two comments uh, that that I'd like to to respond to. Uh, comment number one is uh, the lack of tools to do analysis on rootkits, etc. Um, you did present one tool that that would help that, which seems to be an internal tool um, that you've developed at Idaho National Labs. Is there any intent to make that available for? For others to use, and and uh, I guess you know um, to make it available to the community per se. Um, I think uh, I think we would have the uh, the desire the desire to do it, but uh, most of the tools we develop for internal use are really really hackish and ugly, and so uh, you'd have to read most of the source code to understand how they work. Um, but uh, um, but uh, certainly, if there was somebody that would be willing to uh, willing to pay us to clean up a lot of code and make it sane and presentable, and so we're not terribly embarrassed by our our, our code, then um, then that would uh, that could probably be arranged. Yes. And then the the second one was about. Uh, um, the need for field equipment to be more defense oriented in essence and and to protect against um, so 
this is more just a comment. Um, so in TCIPG a number of years ago, there was a project called uh, Attested Metering where we worked on a cumulative attestation kernel and that was uh, done by, by a researcher here. Um, I, I would point you to look at that paper and, and look at, at some of the work that was done there. While that hasn't been adopted by, by any meter manufacturers, um, all of the meter manufacturers or, or other field engineers um, and, and field equipment manufacturers, if anyone is, is on the line, please do take a look at that paper. You know, some of that work is the basis for some of these defenses that, uh, that Jason's talking about and, and could be used in, in this way to protect against some of these issues. Yeah, I think that's some of the things that we that we, that we need. Um, so it's not quite so quite so easy to find bugs and 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 take over boxes. So Jason, I want to follow up on sort of the end where you started to talk about the path forward and how to uh, ultimately build things that avoid these problems. I mean, it uh, boy, it brings me back to my undergraduate days. You know, I'm old enough that I I sort of remember a lot of these kind of things we used to do, but not for the purpose people are doing today. Um, so one way, which I think you were implying, is that by analyzing all these tricks, how you go hop by hop and how you have to preserve things, that you understand, if you will, the patterns by which the attackers are doing all these things. And then you put what you might call sort of micro defenses in to stop it so they can't hop, you know, just like you would in sort of a, a larger architecture. Um, the other way might be, um, I mean, a lot of these problems just come because sort of not thinking about the problem globally at the beginning. I mean, if, you, if, if they were architected in different ways, these, 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 all these patterns or many of these patterns wouldn't work. Um, I've been trying to think about how you might go forward to build things that didn't have these problems. And either of these, I mean, one of the one of the challenges, of course, is 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 legacy equipment. Mm -hmm. But but neither of these approaches probably work for legacy equipment. So could you, I mean, don't hop up too high level because I really enjoyed your talk. But could you talk about um, what? Uh, <coughs> What recommendations do you have for us to learn how to architect systems that don't have these problems? Are there either approaches I suggest to the way forward, or is it something else? Um, so I think uh, I think when you do legacy stuff uh, with the with the critical infrastructure and manufacturing base and stuff like that, legacy is the is the problem. But there is a uh, um, but with the with new hardware we have the we have additional problems. One is uh, we have all the stuff that we want to install for 15 years and have it not run, and nobody's making the hardware that's designed to last 15 years anymore. And so uh, um, so we have uh, we have all those uh, those those types of problems. So I think uh, I think the approach is. Uh, uh, approaches could work, but I think we have to do a, just a retroactive coding um, instead of. Uh, um, so we need to we need to go redesign. But I think just like address-based randomization wasn't a uh, um, address-based randomization wasn't a, wasn't a cure, but it hurt, hit them where it hurts. I think we can just do small coding changes, and 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 each one of these chunks of firmware that are going to make it much more difficult for them to actually get code execution. So I think we need to hit them where it hurts um, now with the uh, and. We can do that with the legacy stuff, with just a few changes, um, the various randomizations and uh, um, uh, and and internal checks and stuff like that. That would make make it uh, um, actually really hard to achieve code execution, or a reliable code execution without rebooting us. So, so just to make sure I understand, I mean, you start at the beginning and said it's too hard to write new firmware for old hardware, so we can't do that. Oh, and um, uh, you. you, you Oh no! So I said. Uh, um, oh no, that was sorry. Sorry, uh, that was not my my thing. I think we should write new firmware for old hardware, or at least in use hardware, because somebody's maintaining that firmware, or at least most of it, um, and they can go do that. I see. So those folks would be able to do it, but it's it's hard for an outsider. Yes. Yeah, so so okay. it would be hard for a, it would be hard for an outsider to to write patches to the firmware. I see. Is there any hope for uh, building tools that take uh, old firmware for old hardware? And um, well, for example, do a few of the tricks you said to to, to uh, open up a little space, and then automatically put a little extra code in there for good. For example, that might do randomization stuff. Um, 
I'm, I'm working on just such a project. Um, also, uh, um, I'm also working on a project that will reshuffle, uh, reshuffle firmware. So it parses, it parses the firmware down, and then on a per device, reshuffles it so the attacker doesn't know what the address space looks like. He doesn't know where the watchdog timers are getting reset. That would then, be automatic. then that would be automatic, yes. I mean, automatic. Yes, so that is uh, that is that is a chunk of my current research is to is to figure out how to automatically reshuffle legacy firmware in such a way that the uh, uh, that the attacker is is hard for the attacker to hit. Yes. So, yeah. Uh, so I, I the compiler based optimization uh, check technique that you you talked about briefly, I find that pretty interesting. So I had a like a, just a questions about how you do that. Is it that like let's say you you create those abstract syntax tree and you go through the code and you find the first such optimization that you come across. Let's say they use the actual lit string little three instead of the integer, right? So let's say you find that. Is, is, is it possible that then you have like a library of like, you know, compiler versions? You know that you can match up these two optimizations to this compiler version and you know that all of the way it does optimizations. So then you can go back to the syntax tree and check and say, aha, these things don't fit that compiler's pattern. Or is it that you just say, oh, this does three, so every other string literal number must be three done in the same way. And then in, do it in a more ad hoc manner. Do you know what I'm saying? Actually, I started off trying to detect, detect the version and optimization flags of each of the compilers, because yeah. um, I wanted it uh, during my normalization phase. Um, but I found that that was what, that was too much labor. So now I do the the latter, where um, when I detect um, when I detect two micro op trees that perform the same operation. So so the inputs turn into to the, the two inputs turn in the same micro op tree. Um, then I just label one of them uh, A and the next one B and the next one I find C. You find the probability of one having more such and the other one is fewer in number, so probably that's an attack. And the but but it's, what I'm saying is like the first one it could be more rigorous, but the second one you could so if you find the same number you're not sure which one is the attack and which one is the, right. the legitimate and, optimization. And, right? and, uh, and so that's kind of a, a, a cheat. I'm I'm glad you called me on it, is because the way I cheat with it is uh, is I assign each one of those a color and then then plot out the whole graph and then um, then I look for I look for just visually the uh, the clustering of the colors. Um, is the way I do it, which is not a very computer science-y or good way of going about it, but it's been effective and I've been lazy. Uh, we have a question from online. Um, what would your recommendation be for academic security researchers to start studying these issues on multi-MCU embedded systems without operational or trade secret knowledge? What do they need to get started? Um, so, so most of the time, when somebody hands me a, hands me a, a box, then they don't give me source code or documentation or anything with it. Um, so you can do all this strictly from from bootstrapping it up, and it's actually much more enlightening to do it because you're going to have to follow the same attack the path the path the attacker does. So I'd have to say that uh, um, it's really enlightening to just grab one of these uh, devices, um, grab one of the devices, and just like write a replacement firmware for it. Grab the firmware file and write a replacement firmware file, and then make some modifications and start uh, dealing with the realities of those. And uh, um, I think, uh, at least for me, um, you find the realities of writing this was much different than my previous uh, computer science experience had led me to believe that, the pro that it would be. So for the academic people, I would, uh, I would say that uh, um, just jump in and start doing. Um, and, uh, and most of the stuff falls out really fast when the, when, when the firmware blows up in your face uh, for the 50th time that day. Uh, this is Kuan Yu Zhang in UIUC. Uh, I have a question. So, uh, so how many of your approach are based on the unsafety of, uh, in C language? So, if we all write this in a type safe language, how, how many of these uh, exploits will disappear? Um, so, uh, um, so actually, uh, um, uh, so uh, I just finished a, a project for DOE where I, I ported a type safety language, uh, type safe language Python to uh, to smaller microcontrollers and stuck them in. Um, there is a bar from uh, at least where I was able to get to for type safe languages. Um, so, if you're looking at most of these microcontrollers, they're very small and it's really really tough to to shoehorn a type safe language in there. But yes, most of the coding problems that uh, that you uh, we use to get onto uh, the devices are from using type unsafe languages. So if you could figure out how to use a type safe language inside a microcontroller that has 50K and still perform all of the functions of that microcontroller, I think you would be a very wealthy person. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. Uh -huh. oh, thanks. Let's thank our speaker, Jason. 
And uh, please join us again next month uh, with uh, the next TCFG seminar.